Hello, mediums. Welcome to another episode of Live here on Keystroke Medium. I'm Josh Hayes, here with my co-host, the man who once confused Jason Statham's stunt double for his brother, Scott Moon. And today we are extremely excited to have New York Times bestselling author, author Peter F. Hamilton with us. Peter's books have sold millions of copies around the world and is best known for his Night's Dawn trilogy and the Commonwealth Saga. It's Peter, it's a, a pleasure to have you on the show. We're really excited to have you here. Oh, thank you for asking me. Uh, we start out generally our interviews um, with a version of the same question, and um, for our viewers and listeners that, that might not be um, familiar with you, could you tell them a little bit about yourself and your writing? Uh, about myself, I've been published now for 23 years, so it's, it's, it's become my life now. I've always written science fiction um, Rutland, is, well, Rutland, where I live, isn't quite as big as Kansas, but it's certainly the middle of, of, of rural nowhere. Um, so I was growing up in the 70s, uh, you know, with, with both TV channels and no video games or anything <laughs> like this. And I found, basically found the science fiction shelf in the library. Uh, and that was my escape route. That was me out of there. Um, so when it came came time to write something, I wanted to to capture that same sense of escapism that I, that I got when I was a kid, uh, which is why I started writing and, and why I still do write science fiction. Um, you, you are typically known for a uh, large, uh, epic kind of, uh, stories with huge character ensembles and, uh, twisting plots, but you got your start in, uh, publishing through short stories. Is that right? Yes. Um, it was. A, it's a fairly classic route for science fiction writers. We, we come up through the short stories, and, and I did the same thing. I went out when I was 26, I think it was, and, and bought a typewriter. There, there wasn't any word processors back then. Um, mm-hmm. Started, started um, writing the short stories and have the drawers of rejection slips to prove it. Um, Started selling a few, started selling to, to better quality magazines, at which point I thought, right, um, time to give the novel a go, which turned out to be Mind Star Rising. Um, and short stories, I've, I've just lost the art now. I mean, you, you know how big my books are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I can manage maybe one short story every couple of years um, because it, 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 it is something I've just lost now. But, but that was, that was my, my foundation in the genre to, to begin with, yeah. You uh, and actually, you just released a uh, a shorter uh, novella. Um, um, window, window into time. Window into time. And uh, yeah. I, I read that it was very. I, I wasn't sure where it was going uh, until right. obviously until you get to the end, and then I was like, ha, ah, mind blown. Very good. <laughs> um, but even then, that was still. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, Thirty or forty thousand words, maybe. It, I think, yeah, maybe maybe late 30s, 30,000, 30, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's as short as I get these days. <laughs> Very cool. Um, with your Night's Drawn trilogy, there are tons of characters, and I want to get into uh, A Night Without Stars as well, but specifically with the, the million-word epic that is the Night's Dawn trilogy, was it hard for you to keep track of everything that was going on in the book. I know that you do a lot of pre-planning uh, before you start writing, but with all these characters, um, so for me, it's it's hard to keep track of three or four characters in a book, and you've got, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 in that trilogy. Was that uh, one of the, the largest uh, hurdles for that series? Yeah. Um, I, as you say, I, I'm a, I do a lot of notes at the, at the start of a series. I can't Something like that. I have to know how it's going to end before I start writing. You can't uh, start writing something like that and, and hope you can think of a way to finish it. <laughs> you, could um, have a, you could have a lot of loose ends with that many characters and, and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, but um, so yes, it was a lot of notes, um, which which were sort of spread all over the floor, and I worked out the timelines, and and that's how it was put together. Um, People don't believe me, but that 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 was quite heavily edited. Um, 
there are entire storylines that that got ripped out of of the second book, Neutronium Alchemist, purely because I knew if if they carried on and multiplied the way everything else did, then then the third book really would have been unmanageable. Um, so there are there are plot lines. Um, Louise landing on Mars before she got to Earth. Uh, there was one set on an Indian ethnic planet that got completely taken out. Oh wow. Um, so yes, that that is the the small version of of the Night's Dawn. You was the one that actually got published. <laughs> well, and I think it was published in, uh, like in the UK, it was published in three, but here in the US, I think it was wasn't it published in six? Originally, yes, it was, um, because because it was so big, um, and science fiction generally wasn't so large in those days. The the word length, the the page length, mm-hmm. um, they weren't quite sure how to how to how to produce a book that big. Um, so they, they did the, the logical thing, I suppose, and switched into, into two, each of them. It's, it's actually a 12 part trilogy in Italy. Oh, wow. <laughs> a 12 part trilogy. So not only are you reinventing science fiction, but you're reinventing how we call the sizes of books. That's nice. Yeah. So who makes the decisions on, on where to make those divisions? You divide it into 12 parts. Is that something that you and your editors work together or is that, or do you already kind of have an idea for what makes the most sense? We certainly with the American editions, um, the editor and I went through it and, and found you know the, the logical place to split each one. Mm. I didn't have so much say with the with the Italian ones. That was that was all down to the, the physical size of the books that they like over there. Right. Uh, every time they're quite large format books still in America. I think even even though they're in, in three now, but when the, you have the original size in the uk they had to order in special paper to get it that small nice. <laughs> and font size is you know you need a magnifying glass um so physically it was quite a challenge um but the, the thing is it's called a trilogy but it is one story it is one story split into into three three parts um mm-hmm. with fairly re- hopefully fairly reasonable cliffhangers at the end of part one and two um, but it, I always consider them to be just one story. Now, having said that, did you have the entire three book trilogy planned out, like you said, before you started writing book one, or is that something that you planned out book one and then just continued on planning for book two and three? I had loose outlines for two and three when I started book one. Um, and additional material gets added in, as I said, for setting with book two. Right. Um, well, if you if you have an idea on the day you're writing and it's too good to ignore, then then it goes in. So the new stuff then has to be taken into account when you're writing notes for the, for the second book and the third book. So it's flexible enough to do that, which hopefully helps keep the writing quite fresh. If you you, know, you come up with something on the day, then it doesn't have to be excluded. Right. Well, that's very cool. I uh, I uh, have got into your your Commonwealth series on uh, on audiobook with Pandora Star and uh, John Lee reading that. And I yeah. got, uh, we mentioned before that we started recording, I got Scott started on your work through Pandora Star, which I think is probably my favorite uh, novel space opera genre-wise, just because of how vast it is and you hit so many different things. It's not just a, a strictly speaking, like military science fiction novel or an investigation no. novel, or you have like all these parts rolled into one. Um, there, there's a point when I was going through it where it reaches kind of a critical mass and really becomes, it comes its own world. And um, that's what I was really curious about hearing you talk about is how you tie all that together and make all those, those things work. Um, I'm not sure there was a question in there. I think I'm just talking. <laughs> well, it's it's quite it's an organic kind of process. I mean, once once you decide on on okay, the main theme, the main issue or idea for the book, um, you then work out what kind of universe it's going to be set in, which gives you the planets. Uh, I go into that in quite a lot of detail in my notes. Um, I, if you've got a certain level of technology. How does that affect the economy? How does that affect the way people live? What kind of transport do you have? What kind of politics? All that locks together. So that gives you the kind of people that can live in that world, which you then start looking at them and going, okay, well, which which part of the idea can they carry forward? Uh, and do I have to then change the world a little? So like I can say it's, it's a fairly organic process of building the, the, the overall story from that 
that one idea. It's almost like working backwards from it. Is oh, what, yeah. what do you need to make that idea work? There's a lot of worlds in the Commonwealth Saga, and it's almost like, it's almost, I mean, because they have such different tech levels, and a lot of those are elective. Um, like some people live on this world because they want to live this type of lifestyle. Some people go here to, to work and build money for the next phase and all that. So yeah. it gives you a lot of freedom. Is there any particular worlds that you enjoyed creating more in that universe? Um, I would say I liked the the big 15s, the, the heavy industry ones, um, right. even though they're not quite environmentally sound. Um, <laughs> they're, they're there to be exploited, um, which was, right. again, this, it does reflect real life. I mean, you know, this, this is not take, to be taken totally in isolation. I'm not preaching to anybody. But you, you know, the odd little moment in the, in these books where you can make people think and go, oh yes, haven't thought of that. You know, if we carry on this way, right, right. Um, so this, I like taking things to extremes, which is what the big industrial planets were. I mean, they were strip mining entire continents, and and nobody cared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then there was then there was the the quite interesting one of, of Huxley's Haven, um, which yeah. took Aldous Huxley's to the extreme, in which everybody is genetically designed to do their job, which to, to somebody who's fairly liberally inclined like me is absolutely horrific. How can you do that? <laughs> oh, no. But you see, the thing is, once it's been done, they're all perfectly happy doing that. Right, right. And, and they, like, they rebel against being taken out. Paula was taken out, but you know that that would that was then the wrong thing to do, which is a nice play you can, you know, hopefully it will get people thinking. Yeah, I really on both like sides that. of that question. Yeah, I really liked how you tackled that. Like he just said, both both sides. Because do you are you do you go to this planet and then liberate everyone from their for their own uh, good for their own good <laughs> yeah, and then just exactly. completely screw yeah. their whole lives up or you know and then the at the end of uh, Judas Unchained where she, obviously she starts getting sick because there's uh, issues there that she needs to go and arrest this guy and she can't because she knows that she can't at this point and she's got to kind of uh, serve the greater good at this point and she's having a physical reaction to not being able to do it which is kind of how they build her and yeah. uh, that for that her going of, uh, against yeah going against her nature yeah. is very unpleasant for her <laughs> right to say the least well was, it, it is that way for all of us isn't it yeah um, right that's the, the the exaggerated version if you like the the thing about about writing for me is is you you can't have everything black and white nobody thinks they're the bad guy right, right. Uh, everybody thinks they are in the in the right and they're so you have to present both sides of an argument with, with equal fairness, if you like. I've got to put myself in the mind of someone who I'm not, who I'm never going to be, and who I probably don't admire very much. Right. Uh, Gore is the best example of that I can oh, come I love, up with. I Gore. love Gore. He, 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 <laughs> he will take his time talking to the likes of us, you know. Yeah. I mean, is, is, but at the same time, he's absolutely fascinating because of that and the power he wields. So I've got to present him in a way that, that doesn't make him a caricature, if you like. Right. Uh, I've got I've got to see the world from his point of view, and it, it allows me to unleash my inner demon, basically, when I'm writing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very. Like, go ahead, Scott. Go ahead, Josh. Do it, Josh. Go ahead. I uh, I like that you you mentioned it that the um, the bad guy doesn't think that the bad guy because I even even in Pandora's Star where the the bad guy uh, Morning Light Mountain. Morning Light Mountain doesn't think of himself as a bad guy. I mean, even no. he, I, I love the um, when you first meet him and you you go through kind of his evolution through uh, taking over the planet, and then when they capture Dudley Bowes and you're watching through Morning Light Mountain's eyes, like what's going on, and it's it's very eerie and uh, surreal, like him poking um, the female that was with Dudley Bowes and like ripping off an arm, I think, or something like that. And you're like, why are they making these weird noises? And it's just like completely <laughs> oblivious to what's going on. And the, the first contact in that one was definitely yeah. unique to anything I'd seen done <laughs> yeah. before. Uh, but it even, makes you a little uh, nervous about making first contact in a real setting. Oh yeah. But even, yeah. um, the guy, uh, Oh no, I can't think of his name. He's running the, uh, the war against the star flyer, Bradley Johansson. Yeah. Uh, right. Everybody thinks that he's this terrible terrorist and he's really yeah. not. And that yeah. was, that was very cool. Well, that's, that's a play on uh, one man terror. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. He was pretty chill to, to, when we started to meet meet him. He seemed like he kind of had uh, found himself at least. You know, he knew where he knew where he yes. was at personally. Yeah. I'll, yeah. He was he was one guy who knew he was right and was right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so moving into your uh, Fallers uh, Chronicles, I, maybe we'll touch on the void here in a little bit. But the the your recent most recent novel, uh, A Night Without Stars, deals with the Void trilogy. Um, and the Commonwealth universe, but thousands of years in the future, um, and on a different world than the Void trilogy. When you started writing these two books, did were these taken into account when you started planning the Void or the Commonwealth universe, or were these just kind kind of develop as you created the universe? Not when I started writing Pandora's Star. I had no idea it was going to be another three, and then another two after that. Um, but in the in the end of um, which one is it? The evolutionary void, the last of the void trilogy. Right. There is a very small little reference to the other planet in the void, um, because by then I'd started to to come up with the idea of of you know what happened on that planet and why it was completely different from the one we were dealing with in the void. Um, so that and and where did the the um, the big crystal uh, entities come from as well right yeah uh, the the sky lords sky lords yeah yeah um so i was sort of filling in details as i was, was re writing the last book thinking okay i can do more here yeah mm -hmm. and it was i took a break after that and, and wrote great north road so it was quite good fun to come back to it relatively fresh as well uh you know with uh, with the first with uh, a night without stars uh yeah uh, the first Great, you mentioned Great North Road, and I really, really enjoyed the structure of that book. The uh, the flashbacks that you used to tell the story, and and how as you read through the the actual story that was happening, you come to realize also all these different things that happened through the flashbacks, and it all starts to yeah. click together by the time you get done with the book. I thought that was phenomenally well written. Uh, I mean, the story is great, but I love this the the narrative structure. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's. One of the reasons I do change every few books is that I, I don't want to be known as the guy who wrote, you know, the, just the Commonwealth series or just the Night's Dawn series. I want to give other things a go. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've heard of him over there. Um, Ian Rankin, who writes uh, detective work, a detective called Rebus, who's a Scottish. I think he's just had his 20th Rebus book come out, <laughs> which is great. I mean, they're, they're fabulous books, right. but I'm not sure I could do that one universe all the time for, for 20, 25 years. Um, I wanted to do something different. And I did, as you say, as you noted, the, the, narr the narrative structure, if you like, or the way I put it together was different to everything else because I wanted to do it in a different fashion. I feel, you know, you can't just read more of the same every time. You've right. got to try something new with different books. I'm doing it again with the ones I'm writing now. Um, so each, each one is hopefully these days laid out a little more is laid out differently and a little more interesting from the last. Did you get any well, kickback from the publisher on, on the way the format that you have set up for great North road? Or are they just like, yeah, you're, you're no? Beetle hammered and you can do whatever you want. No, uh, that's the thing with editors. Um, it's, it's a mutual trust arrangement we have. If, if I'd done it that way and it hadn't worked, um, then I would have, you know, if the editors had told me, look, this just doesn't work like this. Fair enough. Um, but they obviously thought it did. Um, so there was, there was no complaint about it. When you, when you start out a new project, um, <clears throat> what's kind of some of the first things you do? Are you looking for a certain idea or, or like a certain format or, um, I guess that's, I'm just curious about what's your inspiration to get something started? Um, it, it all comes from that, that, like I said before, that, that one original idea, um, with the night's dawn, it was, you know, the concept of possession, which is basically a horror concept. Um, okay, well, you've got that, so what kind of society would actually stand a chance against that? Because that's a pretty tough thing to come up against. Yeah. Um, and I, I, when, I was, when I was 13 and reading these books from the library, I, I was reading E. Doc Smith, the old Lensman series. I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to read it now. I think my taste <laughs> is <have been> off <laughs> it. Um, but th that sense of escapism, that far future space opera, um, it just struck me that this, A, not many people were doing that at the time I was writing it, um, and B, it was the perfect setting for this. So, so like I say, that comes about in combination. 
Um, so I have to have that, that one original idea. Then I start exploring where it can happen and what can happen in that universe. And it just rolls on from that. And then if the story is quite complex, you've got to look at ways of, of, of telling it rather than a, just a straightforward linear fashion, which is why the, the, we had all the flashbacks in Great North Road. But they, as like I say, I was lucky it did seem to work. With uh, Now with your notes, how, how do you keep track of your notes? Do you have a, a system? Do you use notebooks? Do you use, like Scott and I are big Scrivener fans. I don't know if you're familiar with the program, but uh, it's kind of I different haven't. than Word. But what, what do you use to create? Um, a lot of files on Word, basically. Okay. Um, you know, each planet will have its own uh, file, and it'll be intersections like you know the, the geography, the climate, the. Uh, I, in some cases, if you're if you're spending a lot of time on one world, like we did with Saint Libra in Great North Road, right? Um, I'll go down into into the biology of the plants to some level because um, that had to work in, in Saint Libra. There were, there were no insects, no animals, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, you've got to have the carbon dioxide oxygen cycle. So, how would that work on a planet? Uh, things like that, you've got to answer these days. You can't just write it in and, and expect people to believe it. We've, we've, the bar has been raised a lot over the last 20 years in science yeah. fiction. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and rightfully so, I, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think just uh, some the hand wavium kind of technique. That <laughs> it, it hand wavium, be, uh, is that a word? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, the unobtainium material as well is what I like. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Unobtainium. Um, yeah. So you write in Word. Um, are your novels one word document, or do you do chapters a document? How do you how do you keep track of all that? It, it um, depends on. Actually, it depends on how big a computer I'm using. Okay. Uh, I used I used to do them on the older computer. I used to do them in in chapters, separate chapters. Um, these days, I've got a, a, an iMac which just handles the entire thing in one in one file. It does take slightly longer to to get into the file to start with um, to open it, but, <laughs> yeah. but once you're there, these days nothing matters. Right. So yeah. memory these days is 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 nothing. It's not a problem for anybody. You know, that's a big document when your computer is struggling to open it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Going to, uh, when I first started writing. Um, I used a, a typewriter, but I just used a, a computer called a Tandy 1000, which it had like, I think a one megabyte hard drive in and everything was on five, po uh, five and a quarter floppy disks and you had to, ah, the disks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is, this is what I, we had uh, probably the equivalent of that was the Amstrad over here. Um, and we, you backed up everything every night and that yeah. was drilled into me for about five years and I still do it. I still <laughs> back up religiously every night. You got to. Oh yeah, uh, I I want to ask you while we're talking about how the the craft of your putting together a story. Um, there's a video of you on Facebook. It's just Pan McMillan did an interview series with you, and uh, I, I've done a lot of studying of your work just because I I am a writer and I try to learn and and I study how writers actually physically write. And um, in this video, I could see you writing a. a a story and I'm not ever sure if it was something that got published or whatnot, but it kind of reminded me of like a, a, a snowflake type method story where you go in and you write the bare bones and then you flesh it out a little bit more and then you flesh it out a little bit more. Is that kind of how your writing goes from page one, chapter one? Do you just kind of go? You um, must have seen the bottom of the current page where I will, everything above that would have been fleshed out perfectly. And then if I've got, one or two ideas, or if I'm having an art, if characters are having an argument, I'll make the the, the bullet points, if you like. Okay, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the sequence the argument comes in. Right. Then I will flesh that out with with proper dialogue. Oh, very cool. So, yeah, it's uh, and then and then it gets. The way I write is I will start a. Uh, this is a, a general, a typical day is that I will come in at, at, at sort of nine o'clock or whatever, and I will read through what I did yesterday and polish it as best I can, improve the argument, improve the description, the prose, so that by lunchtime, say, I'm back at the end of, of the story where I left off. So then I just carry on with fresh writing for the afternoon and evening, and then repeat and repeat and repeat. So it, this, this question of first draft, second draft, third draft, 
I think um, I think word processing for me anyway has has kind of eliminated that. It's it's like a constantly evolving draft. Okay. So that when it does finally get handed in to the editor, it's basically as good as I can get it. It doesn't then get come back for me for second drafting or third drafting. Right. Well, by that time, your editor should know like the the basics of your story probably and and where you're going with it and all that by the time they get that. Oh yeah. File. It, that's an interesting way to put that. Cause I've talking about with Josh, I've wondered sometimes about how to call something. Is this a first draft? Because it's not really done as a first draft. It's really like the fifteenth time I've gone to this section of it, and things like that. You said something about uh, how you, you develop the argument. Is that like a theme or a point or an element of the story that we can talk about? Uh. Which argument? The one in? No, you said you said you work on the argument of your oh, the day's writing. I was giving an example. The you know if, if the characters are having an argument, oh, okay, each got to have their their point, and so it's it's the sequence you you put the the points in to, to counter each other and try and right. trip each other up that kind of thing. Um, so when it comes to actually writing the dialogue for that, okay, it's like an extension of the notes, if you like. It's like a more detailed extension of the notes. Right. Same with. Um, with the, describing a world or a place they're going to, um, it'll have a you know they went into whoever's house it was. So I then will flesh out the house, and then you've got to decide in the redrafting: is am I giving it too long an explanation? Should I cut this down? Uh, can I? How can I improve it? So it, it is this this constant revision of, of of the prose that has been written the day before. And do you? Uh... Do you have a certain number of words that you try to get in a, no. in a day? You just no. go for however long no. it takes you? Um, I'll go, because uh, we've got, well, they're not that small anymore, but they're, they're sort of 12 and, and and 10, my kids. So they take up quite a bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> so it, the work gets fitted in around that at the moment, which, I mean, I'm not complaining. I get to spend a lot of time with my kids, more than most guys do. Um so it, it will get fitted in around that. When we get nearer to deadlines, I'll work longer into the evening. But I think trying to force something, uh, you know, I've got to do two and a half thousand words a day. I, no, you're, you're, not, you're not making a product. You're writing something. Right. Um, I've had days where it will go superbly. I've had days where I can barely get a paragraph written because the story just isn't there. Um, but it, it averages out. Um, I tend to measure it in, in kind of hours. You just keep hacking away there, and eventually the, it, it will come good in the end. Well, I know a lot of writers, they stick to that. You have to, If you write so many, th you have a goal to write 1,000 words a day, 500 words a day, 3,000, whatever it is. But what if you're revising and you're not producing a lot of new words? Yeah. What if what if you're cutting words? <laughs> do you, yeah. do you yeah. feel bad because you cut? I wrote negative 20 words today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a total loser. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, but uh, the rest of the words have been improved by them being taken out. That's what yeah. you've got to judge it by. Right. Yeah, that's the way. Um, so you, the the Commonwealth universe is, I, I believe you said, is all wrapped up. It's all taken care of. We're done in that place I now? Or Never say never, but uh, <laughs> it, I'm not going back there for several years, put it that way. Okay. Um, is there anything that you can talk about for uh, the Salvation series that's coming up? Yeah, it's um, it's going back to that having to do something different thing. Um, it's it's set in a completely new universe, new characters, new technology, new aliens. Um, it's a trilogy, of course. Uh, the narrative structure is different again. Um, you've got five main characters have been sent out to investigate an alien ship, and en route they they each you get their backstory for each of them which helps build the universe. And at the same time, there's a mystery that one of them is trying to, to unravel by hearing the other's story. So that's quite, a, again, a, a quite a different narrative structure for me. Um, and then, in, then, then this will carry on. The, that narrative structure won't carry on, but it, the, the whole story will carry on when we get to the alien ship and find out just what was wrong with it and just what it's doing there. That will lead into volume two and three. So I, I can't really give you specifics more than that because, again, it's quite a complicated story. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But something new for me. I had to do something new. And you think that'll be out, what, uh, 2018 probably? 
Where are we now? Yes. Yeah, really should be out by then. Uh, I'm quite well through it. Oh, so, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, things take a lot. Once you hand it in, that's only the start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a huge, huge editorial process. Um, then there's the getting the cover, the, 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 the thing all, ed- all writers hate, which is the copy edit. Um, and then there's the second copy edit because I've got to go through the American and the British ones. <laughs> By the time it reaches publication, I really hate that book. <laughs> <laughs> it can feel like work after the 30th time through something, oh, looking man, for yeah. the minute details. And you're crossing yeah. it, looking at it. Well, that's very yeah. interesting. How many, how many editors do you normally work with on a, on a, on a project? Um, I will work with the, the British and the American editor. Um, they both, the, it will, the manuscript will go out to both of them. I'll get notes back from both of them, and I will combine the notes and write another single manuscript from that, which then goes out to both of them again. And they're very by that time, hopefully, there are very, very few, you know, things out of place, and will only be a few sentences need changing. Then it goes into copy editing. What are those? Um, do you ever so- want to take your um, uh, American editor and British editor and put them in the same room and just let them just duke it out? <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> See, let's get this resolved once and for all. Method, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an idea. I'm just throwing it out yeah. there. I mean, maybe a possibility um, for the future. Most of them are, are the, the comments are fairly similar. So in that case, you you know they're probably right. Um, but I again, it's this question of trust. I I, I trust the editors. Um, they are professionals. You, as an author, you get far too close to what you've written when it when it finally leaves your desk. Right. Um, so you, you do ten, I do tend to rely on them for their opinions about uh, you know this section is too long, this one doesn't make sense, you've you, you've done this wrong, explain this more, all that kind of thing. Um, it's is it's essential basically. So you don't get typically you don't get uh, his eyes were blue here or green here. These are. Uh, content issues that they're helping you f- see what where the the holes are at in your manuscript. No, the um, the different colored eyes and and hair is is all down to mainly down to the copy editors. The editors catch a lot of it, um, but the the copy editors will catch stuff like this. No, the editing process is is more about whole sections, um, and you know there was a party in Great North Road thrown by a, a prince, and I wanted. You know, I wanted this to be this, the most decadent party you could go to ever. <laughs> um, and, and both notes came back saying, yeah, we get it. We don't need 30 pages of one party. <laughs> <laughs> we get the point. Um, and they were right. Uh, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking when you've got to chop out, you know, 15 pages you've, you've slaved over. But, yeah, I took the point. They were Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh... I imagine that was quite a party. I'm just saying, you know. Uh, that was the idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> after, after reading some of the the, the uh, events in Pandora Star and and uh, and uh, Judas Unchained, there's 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 definitely some characters that go out there beyond maybe like my personal comfort zone. <laughs> it's in real life, so yeah. Well, uh, you know, people do. People are people are very varied and interesting. Yes. Oh, yeah. But that, it's, that, that, it's fun when you're listening to the audio book and you get to one of those steamy scenes and you have to pay attention. Is there anybody in the car with me? Is there is I have it on my earphones or what am I doing? I usually turn it up really loud, roll down the windows and just drive around <laughs> and see what the neighbors think of some of, some of those stories. So um, – <laughs> Going back to kind of uh, the Commonwealth universe, there's been rumors of a TV show that's been in the works. Is that still in the works? Is it something we're still going to be able to see? Yes, that's still in the works. If you'd <laughs> asked me asked me a year ago, I would have I would have said yes, that's in the works, and yes, that's <laughs> still in the works. Um, there really is a place called uh, Pre Development Hell. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was just a myth, but no, it's not. Um, I, I can't give you any details because it, it's been optioned. The producer is is trying to to get a script organised. I've seen some fabulous artwork. Okay, um, been done. Um, Hollywood works on a time scale unknown to the rest of humanity. <laughs> it's, um, it's frustrating and interesting at the same time. Yeah, but yes, there, there is there is interest in it. It'll be interesting to see how they take. 
um, such a large book and and make uh, like kind of like they did with uh, a Game of Thrones and they take the first novel and made it into a series. It'd be interesting. To yeah, see. that well, that was the game changer. I mean, the the, the option is for for the for TV, um, not a film. I mean, you you I don't think even Peter Jackson could make my books into a. <laughs> No, no, yeah, probably not. But um, you, yes, I mean, Game of Thrones changed everything. We've got the technology now. Every anything I write can now be visualized on screen. Right, that's no longer a problem. Um, and with the with things like Netflix and Amazon Prime and HBO, the the series scope is there now. You can you can make these multi strand epics. Um, it's it's a great it's a great age for for stuff like mine to be to be made. Absolutely, um, and hopefully it will eventually come together as as a you know many series. Uh, well, it's proven that that fans of that genre will will stick with a story for years. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's funny to watch some of my favorite series and realize that some of like the child actors and stuff are like completely grown up now <laughs> from when they started the series. So. Yeah, the, the, I well, think yeah. Be a when you look at the, thing. the thing, I think that they're doing great now with science fiction is they're not doing campy science fiction really anymore. They're doing very good, like the Expanse uh, series that is uh, is out now, uh, based off of Leviathan Wakes from uh, James S. A. Corey. That series, it's not campy, it's not cliched, it's just very like very good writing, and it and. I think uh, there was an interview you did one time uh, where uh, people ask you, well, why do you write science fiction? Why don't you just write other fiction? Because I can't read that science fiction stuff. That's too weird. And, <laughs> and your response was, well, if, if you don't understand what's going on in my book, then I've failed as an author to convey the story because it should be just pick it up and read it and you should be able to understand what's going on yeah uh, right. and i think that they've done a really good job with the expanse and a couple of other science fiction series just to put you in the story and it doesn't matter whether it's spaceships or dragons just to tell the character yeah. story yeah um yeah that's a big argument i i have with, with some of my writer friends is is how much should you hit the ground running um if you've got you know 10 on a 10 new words on, on the first page <laughs> that fair enough and you're not a science fiction writer a reader then fair enough that you look at it and you go no haven't got a clue right i do prefer to to lead people into a story a little more gently these days um having said that probably the first page of, of reality dysfunction isn't that but the, <laughs> um you know i mean Great North Road starts off with a snowstorm above New Newcastle, right? And then detective fiction. Yeah, that you know, if you've not read science fiction before, that is a good way to lead people in. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Well, I get the storm. I get they found a body. Oh, that's interesting. How did they do? You know, and then bring them in that way. Um, um, so I, you're you're it's kind uh, of a learning curve that's more accessible to somebody who's new to the genre. Then in that yeah, case. I mean the, the the worst thing for me is if you've got to have a glossary at the back. Uh, right. If you've got you've got to have if you've had that you haven't written it properly. If you want to introduce and science fiction is all about ideas. If you want to introduce a new idea to someone, don't hit them over the head with it. Lead them lead them to it gently. You know, make it obvious what is happening. Uh, the, my opinion. I mean, there, there are many types of science fiction out there. Many ways of writing it. But to me, that is that is what I aim for, if you like. Right. Um, you know, this this come on in and I'll show you wonders approach. Yeah. There you go. Um, I do want to uh, mention here that's kind of off subject. Um, you not only are you uh, very successful in your writing, but you give back to the writing community as well. Uh, specifically, our uh, Scott and I are part of a Facebook group, Space Opera, um, and we have a Space Opera writing group. And uh, every quarter we do a flash fiction thousand word uh, competition and you judged the summer competition, which was very cool to see the, uh, the feedback you gave to the, the, the finalists in that, um, in that competition. Uh, do you ever see yourself doing that again? Or uh... Uh, I, I believe I might have been, been tapped up for, for another one coming up fairly soon. Oh, yeah. Nice. Very cool. Um, yes. Uh, but that's that's a, a part of what I like about the community, if you like, uh, of science fiction. I mean, going back to, to when I started, um, 
the editors of magazines, of certainly of science fiction magazines, if you, you can send in unsolicited stuff and they would comment on it and they would tell me, you know, this bit doesn't work, that bit does. They didn't get paid for that. Right. And I'm sending in right. stuff years and got this, this free advice. Um, and if you go to conventions, um, you know, you can approach other people in the, in the field and, and have sensible discussions with them. And so the, the, this is just, to me, this is just naturally part of what, of what the science fiction community is. I have no problem with it. Yeah. Um, if, they, if there were 20,000 page stories, <laughs> <laughs> stories <laughs> Might be I a don't different. have the time, but I, I can do this easily enough. It's not a problem for me. I know that being on the Facebook page, it's it's a very popular thread. People are getting very excited about it, and it, I don't know, it's ex the excitement is is fun to fun to watch, even if you can't participate in it. Yeah, that, that, that's so, another thing. I mean, you know, we've got communities like the fact that you like the Space Opera Facebook page. There's so much science fiction out there, and so many people are interested in it. It's it's a it's a good time to be a science fiction author. Yeah. Um. So we're kind of coming to the end of the program, um, but uh, for any aspiring authors that are out there watching the show or listening to the podcast, do you have any uh, nuggets of uh, inspiration or wisdom that you could share to something? That author, you'd... author wisdom is a, is a rare thing. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm sure everyone who's, who's writing would have heard this before, but just keep writing. That is the best way you can learn for yourself how to improve. Um, just simply the art of, lo of looking at what, again, writing, looking at what you've done, reading it through fresh, going on to improve it. It's, it's, it's a constant thing. You're not going to go from zero to, to 100 in a, in a year. Um, these things take time and they take practice and you've got to stick with it um, would, be, would be my advice. Fairly simple, but but actually very real and essential. Absolutely, I agree. Well, Scott, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> you would ask me that. I thought there was gonna be no trick questions. Come on, <laughs> putting you on the spot, Scott. I uh, I know. Oh, I mean, I could have gone in all kinds of stuff about Morning Light Mountain and, and some of those things. Um, but uh, see, questions. Normally, I take handwritten notes on the side, <laughs> but I just kind of been. Hanging out, fascinated, and stuff. Oh, I was going to ask earlier. It's not a huge groundbreaking question, but I, I um, I'm assuming you're a big fan of trains and stuff like that. There's, there's a heavy. Uh, not here. You, you're Al Reynolds, possibly is your man for trains. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we've I, we got a, a rail rail line through the, the town I grew up in, and mm -hmm. we were just. You know, I I was growing up just after steam engines had finished. Right. Um, but they still had that fascination for me. Uh, I think every kid has, uh, you know, has yeah. the train set. Um, so yeah, I, I do that, but um, not a. I'm not a fanatic about them. Put it that way. <laughs> I was I was curious if that was for the story or or a kind of a combination of things. But um, if any, nobody's read the Commonwealth series yet, they they'll see some definitely some super trains, trains of every shape and size. I'll tell you because this is this is an idea. It, it's one of those awful questions we get: is where do you get your ideas from? Um, mm -hmm. Which is unanswerable. But the, there are some things that that actually inspire you and, and make you think. And oh, how can I do a fix on this? Because um, the UK is a, is an island. Right. You can't travel to another country by land. Okay, you've got to take a boat or a plane. You know you've gone there. There is you know there's no easy border. And then, then we built the, the Channel Tunnel to France. And I took a few trips on this. It's, it's a fabulous piece of engineering. I mean, you just drive your car onto the train, um, the doors close, and it's the smoothest ride you'll ever have. And, wow. you know, 30 minutes later, you're in France. Um, and I sort of thought, this is the nearest thing I've ever been to teleporting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And I'm, okay, so I, I've traveled this... Why Why is it always starships? Why can I not just travel this smoothly and easily and not and without any fuss? Right. If we've got a, a technology that can get us between stars, why not make it this easy? And if you build a wormhole between planets, they're obviously going to be expensive. So the, the, the way you get your money back is you shove through as many goods and commerce as you can, as fast as you can. And that the, the two just combined. And it was trains. Right. Yeah. 
that is that is where the whole system came from. It came from a trip to France. Hey, you that know is where what? the whole system came from. I, I really enjoyed that uh, that aspect of the uh, the Commonwealth because it's when you think about it, it well if you could build a worm, wormhole, why would you put it in space where you have to deal with all the yeah. uh, you know the difficulties in getting radiation air and all that stuff, radiation, no <laughs> air, uh, <laughs> but then you put it on the ground and walk through it. It's it's a phenomenal idea. I would never have thought about it, but it, it works so well in the story. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Pretty excellent. So I'm looking forward to going further. I, Josh got me started on your works, obviously, and I, and I, I have a lot more fun ahead. <laughs> but yeah, I, no, I don't have any questions. To answer your question, Josh, I don't, I'm just, I'm just awesome. enjoying it. Hanging out. Uh, well, Peter, it was a blast to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on and taking time well, to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Everybody that's watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. If you're listening on the podcast, we appreciate you. Uh, your support, and uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Take it easy.